machine learning to scientific discovery, discovery physical systems that help the machine. quantum electrodynamics uh, is currently Okay, very well. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I've already had a couple of really interesting discussions with some of you here uh, during my stay. And so what I'm trying to tell you about today uh, deals with how we can make a computer help us improve quantum technologies. And so that uh, relates to the revolution that is ongoing and I guess all of science and technology triggered by uh, the use of deep neural networks and machine learning that started in general in 2012, I would say, 10 years ago. And in physics in particular, for the last five years, uh, people in various areas of physics have been uh, applying machine learning. And so uh, this is now also a big focus of our group at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light. And I'm, uh, before I come to the main topic of the talk, I just uh, run quickly through the topics that uh, we are dealing with. For example, we are applying machine learning for photonic systems, phononic systems, or for transport of waves in general. For example, using neural networks to predict band structures. You give me the geometry, I predict for you the band structure and maybe its topological properties. Then, uh, more generally speaking, we are also asking questions about how can we make the computer mimic a human scientist that comes up with a hypothesis and thinks about which quantities to measure next in a given physical system in order to acquire the most amount of information from that system. Uh, for example, we recently uh, had an idea of how to make the computer discover the most important quantities in any given physical system, which a physicist might call collective coordinates. We are also turning things around sometimes, so we are sometimes asking how can physics uh, help towards better machine learning. For example, how can we build efficient devices that uh, act as an information processing device that can be trainable, and how to do so in a way that is very energy efficient and very rapid and so on. But then in this particular talk, I want to focus on how to apply machine learning towards quantum technologies. And I should say, uh, the goal is that you understand as much as possible, so uh, any time during the talk, please stop me if you don't understand something. Good. So this is the setting. We are aiming towards building quantum computers or other quantum devices that help us in the future to do things much uh, better than uh, using classical technologies alone. But uh, the road uh, towards that goal is very hard, and so maybe a computer, a classical computer can help us by uh, making use of neural networks. And if you are interested in an overview of the field of using classical machine learning for quantum technologies in general, then I also refer you to this uh, re review which we recently put out on the archive. Okay, so the particular kind of approach that I want to introduce to you now is called reinforcement learning. And you will understand in a moment uh, where the name comes from. It's a big set of techniques uh, invented by computer scientists already several decades ago, conceptually at least, which have uh, in the past been extremely powerful and useful. And so to set the stage, I should first tell you that say 80% of machine learning being applied nowadays is not of this type of reinforcement learning, but it goes under another heading, which is supervised learning. So supervised learning, you can understand by imagining you have a teacher who is very smart and a student who tries to imitate the teacher. So the teacher will tell the student a lot of questions together with the correct answers. 
and then the student memorizes these and slightly extrapolates these maybe to slightly different looking questions that it will also try to answer. So this is what happens if you usually teach a neural network to give you predictions like classifying an image. The problem with this approach is the final level is obviously kind of limited by the level of the teacher. If the teacher is not very smart, the student will never get very smart by imitating the teacher. That's not what we expect from a really good student, and that's also not what we expect from a scientist. So in science, we want to discover new stuff. Maybe we want to one day become better than our teacher. So how do we do that? Well, the only technique we know is basically trial and error in a very rough and provocative way. So we try out something, maybe it doesn't work, so we consider it further. We try out another thing and it works, at least to some degree, so maybe we keep it and then we start to vary it and try different things on the basis of that. And so step by step, by trial and error, we become better. And in order to do that, we don't need a teacher who already knows the answers, who already knows the best strategy. We just need someone to tell us whether we are doing good or not. So this is still something we need to know. And so in that way, in principle, it's essentially become as good as um, yeah, anyone at or at the name given to this set of approaches is reinforcement learning. Because what you are doing is you are reinforcing the stuff that worked and you're dropping the stuff that didn't work. So it's reinforcement learning. Famously, a reinforcement learning with the help of neural network used to teach a computer to play games and to play these games really outperforms even the best humans on the planet, even in games that are as complex as the board game of Go. So maybe some of you have heard about this. Uh, it went through the press. So that is deep reinforcement learning using neural networks uh, with this reinforcement learning techniques. So in order to understand how these techniques work, uh, first, here's the setting that the computer scientists imagine. We have an agent, which is like the robot or the neural network that tries to do something as well as possible uh, inside its surroundings. And the surroundings or the world around it, they are called the reinforcement learning environment. Uh, so that's basically the whole world that you can manipulate and which you can observe. And then based on your observations, you will decide to take one or the other action. Basically. Now here's an important distinction that will become important later in the talk. When you talk about the world or the environment around you, the question is, do you have a model of this world, a mathematical model? If yes, call it a model-based approach because if you have a mathematical model of the world then you can plan ahead then you can imagine if i did this and this and this and the sequence what would happen in the world and would i arrive at the goal that i want to arrive at so that is model-based reinforcement learning where you can really plan because you have a mathematical model of the environment on the other hand in many cases you won't have a model. For example, a robot moving around surrounded by humans will not have a mathematical model of what the humans are doing. Also, in other cases, maybe in principle, there could exist a mathematical model, but you're dealing with your qubit and you haven't really calibrated the parameters perfectly, so you don't quite have a reliable model. In that case, there's also technique that can be used for those cases, and these are called model-free. You're not making use of a model. And so, um, in this talk, I will try to introduce to you a set of examples uh, where we have shown how to use reinforcement learning uh, to improve quantum technologies. These will be correction, uh, experimentally reinforcement learning to a real qubit device. They are under the headline of model-free reinforcement learning. We are not making use of any model of the quantum system. And then, uh, in the last uh, part of the I will tell you that if you do have a reliable model, you can even improve the performance. OK, so coming back uh, to this technique of reinforcement learning, specifically the case of model-free reinforcement learning, where I don't assume any model uh, that I 
have been given. So you take an observation and you try to map this observation to the next action you want to take. And this mapping from the observed state to the next action, that's called a policy, or you might call it a strategy. And it will be our goal to find the best possible strategy to reach a certain target. And now one way to encode this policy would be to talk about probabilities. So given the observed state S, what's the probability that I should take a certain action A? So that's a probabilistic policy in, as opposed to deterministic. And there is an advantage in having such a probabilistic policy um, because you can imagine that it is parametrized by some parameter theta, or this may, maybe actually many parameters, and you can now start changing these parameters, adapting these probabilities continuously and trying to increase the reward that your agent gets in the long run by adapting this policy. So that's why people like this. And so um, there are several technical approaches to doing reinforcement learning. They basically fall into two very big classes. And let me just very briefly give you the basic idea of one of these big classes of reinforcement learning, model-free reinforcement learning. These are so-called uh, policy gradient methods. And I like this example because it's extremely simple conceptually. So imagine someone teaches you what is the, re the reward after you've gone through a sequence of actions, you finally arrive somewhere, and maybe you did well, you prepared the quantum state that you wanted to prepare, so you get a high reward. The next time you try something, maybe the reward is low. So what we want to really do is have a very high average reward. Find the policy that has a very high average reward. And so the very naive way to do this, since the policy has been parametrized, is to do gradient ascent. You have to change the parameters in the policy so as to improve on average this um, reward. So what you do is you change the parameter theta according to the gradient of the uh, overall reward with respect to the parameters. And then you can work through the math and you find that this gradient that you need to have is actually obtained in the following way. So you go through an action sequence, so that's the sum over time, and you look at the probabilities for all the actions that were actually taken during this particular sequence. You take the derivative of these probabilities, or rather the logarithm of these probabilities with respect to the parameters, and you weight it according to the final reward. And so what this formula means in the end is, if the reward was high, you will increase the probabilities of taking these particular actions, because apparently they were good. So the next time around, you want to make them even more likely. If, on the other hand, the reward was low, you will suppress the action probabilities. And so over time, going through many, many trajectories, many examples, you will actually find the best policy. And so the way uh, people enter neural networks into this game is that they uh, And the parameters theta will actually be the weights and biases inside the neural network. Okay. Quantum physics. And so this is what we did back in 2018, which is the example I want to start with. So at the time, there hadn't been any real application of uh, reinforcement learning to physics or specifically quantum physics. And we uh, wanted to figure out what would be a good test case. And quantum error correction uh, struck us as a good test case because quantum error correction is a domain where you want to figure out whether there has been an error in a quantum computer and you do this by measurements. And then based on the measurement, maybe you flip a qubit to correct the error. So that's a typical feedback situation. And that's exactly the kind of situation that reinforcement learning is good for because you're taking observations and based on the observation, you try out the next action. Okay, so you can view reinforcement learning often as a kind of game. You have to formulate a game and then the computer tries to become good at this game. So let me formulate the game for you. We have a few qubits, not very many, <laughs> and they are subject to noise. And the goal will be to preserve the quantum state that was encoded inside these qubits against the noise. And again, we can turn this into a reinforcement learning setting. Uh, we can say, 
um, the qubits together with the noise, they form the reinforcement learning environment. The agent would be a neural network. The measurement results uh, when you measure these qubits and uh, execute certain actions, which in this case might be the gates, so the simple operations that you can act on the qubits, like flipping a qubit or making two of them interact. And the uh, procedure would be, as I explained before, you try out different actions, possibly randomly at first, you get some reward that teaches you how well you preserve the quantum information, and then you improve your strategy. So again, uh, to make it really clear, uh, we initialize, uh, say, one of the qubits in an arbitrary superposition state, and it will be our goal to preserve the state as long as possible, despite the fact that there is noise. And so uh, I'm now going to display the strategy in form of a quantum circuit. So as usual for quantum circuit, each line corresponds to one qubit. There are four qubits, four lines, and time runs to the right. And so now, um, if I don't know anything, I will just wildly try out different actions. This is really how the agent starts, randomly different actions. One action might be, uh, say, a two-qubit gate, a controlled knot. So I flip the second qubit depending on the state of the first. I do it again for another pair of qubits and again. And then maybe I choose to measure. For example, I measure this qubit. Now, if you followed very carefully what happened here, uh, this sequence generated an entangled state. And when you now measure, you will actually collapse the state of all the qubits, which is exactly not what you wanted to have. This would be a really bad strategy. Yeah? Uh, but that's the situation that the agent finds itself in at the beginning of training. And so we uh, did this uh, in an example. So what you'll see here is at the beginning of training, randomly chosen gates, and it's really performing poorly. But then over time, it gets better. And what's happening is it avoids these really bad measurements. It starts to understand that it should entangle the qubits in a certain way. It discovers that uh, it should also, it can do measurements, but only measurements that are smart in a way that will never collapse the quantum state in a bad way. Uh, apply them periodically and eventually also find out if you do detect that there is an error, how to correct the error. So that's a very, uh, and once this works for a particular geometry, of course, the advantage of having uh, this general approach is that you can immediately apply it to many other, say, topologies. So you could connect the qubits in a different way. Maybe the qubits are arranged in a chain and only neighboring qubits can interact with each other. Maybe only one of the qubits can be measured. Maybe all of them can be measured. Maybe the topology is even more complicated. So now you can just throw any of these topologies to the computer and let it run for some time, and it will figure out a quantum error correction strategy that is adapted to this particular situation. And so these red boxes, for example, they show what happens if one measurement starts to indicate something went wrong, that an error has occurred, a qubit has been flipped, for example, uh, and then it uh, has to figure out where exactly is the error and what to do against it. And then you can do more quantitative um, comparisons. For example, you can look at how these error corrections move the overall effective coherence time versus the bare coherence time when you didn't do any of the error correction. Yes, please. There's a question, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so it ha has a small restricted set of operations just the single qubit gates and the two qubit gates. And you could also vary these uh, actions depending, say, on the qubit platform. Maybe in some you have uh, controlled not as a good two qubit gate, and another it's a different type of gate. Exactly. So, exactly. So it discovers this on its own, so to speak. So it discovers that a direct measurement of a single qubit is a really bad idea. But if it sets aside one of the four qubits as, as a kind of ancilla qubit, even without, without knowing the word or concept of ancilla, uh, then it will do a controlled knot uh, of one qubit and then the other qubit with the ancilla and then start to measure the ancilla. And so then indirectly it has discovered, oh, that's a parity detection and it will not collapse my quantum state. Yeah. So there's another question just right
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So in this field, there are no guarantees. I mean, even in the field of classic network uh, training, um, you can. So what we. my small quantum modules in a very hardware adapted way um, to improve the performance of these small quantum modules. And then maybe these will form the, the substrate. These will form the, the first layer of improved qubits. And then on the next, maybe eventually you go to something like the surface code. So the uh, thinking is really in terms of these modular quantum computing or also in terms of the hardware uh, uh, efficient uh, quantum computing where uh, on the lowest level, you, 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 you want to improve the hardware. So we will never be able to go. So we are now working towards, uh, say, going um, towards uh, 5 to 10 qubits or so. This is all done via simulations. Uh, um, um, uh, we will never be able to go towards, uh, say, 20 or so. Uh, I don't think that's possible. Um, even if you did run it with a, a connection to a quantum computer, where, of course, the exponential overhead of the simulation would immediately be uh, obsolete, so it wouldn't apply. Uh, there would still be the question, uh, uh, space of possible strategies still explodes exponentially with a number of qubits. And so uh, it's not guaranteed that this would help you any anyway. Yes, uh, I think there was a question first here. Yeah. So the initial choice is to That's a good question. So we never tried out. Uh, what would happen? Maybe. Ah, uh, yes, so um, here it was all Clifford circuits, yeah, because in a sense we knew that uh, this would be sufficient uh, already to find quantum error correction. Uh, yeah, that's a very good point. Of course, we know that for the... That's something that already helps uh, a little bit, yeah. Regards, uh, because the case has a particular structure. And have, uh, No, uh, that's of, yeah, no, no, no. So, um, so what people, so when people write uh, about quantum error corrections, say in a textbook, so they will give you um, the proper encoding, what's the logical qubits, uh, what should be the syndromes, what should be the logical operations. But that is still somehow agnostic of the hardware platform, so to speak, of the gates that you would even need to produce these encoded states or the gates that you would need to do these syndrome measurements and so on. Um, and so uh, there would be, have been one option that we start already from this level of knowledge that we say, oh, we know about stabilizer codes and we know about syndrome measurements, but let me uh, use the computer to optimize any of these sub pieces. That, that would be an option. Here we chose to go even one level earlier, uh, just saying, okay, please preserve my qubit which is useful because I'm not showing this example here, but there are other cases where let's say you have 
um, noise that is uh, spatially quite uniform and acts on several qubits simultaneously. And then it might actually uh, discover other strategies to mitigate errors, for example, some decoherence free subspaces or measuring the noise indirectly by setting aside a few qubits, measuring those and then learning about the noise that must have acted on the other qubit. So it's able to discover all of these uh, because we're not restricting. So, yeah, please. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, yeah, good question. So, um, uh, that would be in the longer version of the talk, but um, the most naive approach would be you go in with an arbitrary quantum state, like some superposition of a single qubit state, and then in the uh, final end, you look at this particular qubit and calculate the overlap uh, with the initial state, and uh, the larger it is, the better it is. Uh, we did this, of course, initially, and we failed. So even with the most high-level uh, state-of-the-art reinforcement learning techniques, it simply gets stuck. Um, and so um, the reason is, it's very hard if you only get a reward at the very final end of time telling you whether you did well or not, because initially with the random sequences, you will always do pretty badly. And so the overlap will always be very low. Yeah? And so that's a very bad learning signal. And so what we then invented was at, um, a technique where at any intermediate time, you would be able to ask how much of the initial quantum information is still preserved even though it may not exist anymore only in a single qubit, but it may be existing in a very complicated uh, entangled state that is distributed over many qubits. And so there went a little bit of thinking uh, into the formulation of that kind of quantity. But then we can calculate this for any time step. And so there may be strategies which only fail at later times, catastrophically maybe, but at least at early times they are already pretty good. And so this is how the algorithm slowly becomes better, yeah? because it will first do the, at least the first few steps right, and then it will <laughs> bootstrap itself into becoming better. So that's an important question. So, yeah, maybe final question. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, in this quantity that, that I just talked about, um, uh, the, say, say it's one if you perfectly preserve the initial quantum information and then it gradually decreases. Um, so in that sense, uh, it's continuous. Okay, so ah, I see there's a lot of interest. <laughs> uh, but now I want to show you some, something else. So obviously this was all still based on theory on simulations. And then one question is, can you apply this to experiments? Um, now we, have to start modest. <laughs> we, we will not even not go for the five qubit case or so in a real experiment, but we started with a single qubit. Now that's not about error correction now, but um, uh, about simply an initializing a single qubit in uh, collaboration with the team of Andreas Walder at ETH. And this is not yet out, but it will be out this week. I hope. So um, there's very little in terms of experimental learning for quantum devices yet. And all the existing ooh, maybe, um, approaches, they um, do not have to do any feedback. Yeah? So basically, in the end, they discover kind of pulse sequences. So they get better and better using this reward structure that I talked about, um, but they uh, do not need to do measurements and based on the measurement result, uh, decide on one or the other action. This is something to... Now, um, if you deal with qubits, especially superconducting qubits, which are relatively fast, uh, then this becomes a challenge because your neural network has to calculate the next action within the coherence time of the qubit. So that's a challenge. And so uh, what we did together with our experimentalist colleagues was 
uh, to do reinforcement learning of a neural network agent that was really implemented on an FPGA, which is one of those very fast uh, uh, hardware chips uh, program. Achieve a cycle time that is from observation to next action of less than a microsecond, which is really, really good because first it's a uh, coherence time of the qubit, so it makes sense. And it's, as far as we know, also 100 times faster than any other reinforcement learning agent that, that, that is out there in uh, experiments. Okay, so uh, the trick behind this was that um, if you have a neural network, now this would introduce a latency of several hundred nanoseconds and you don't like this so what we did instead was as the measurement data the the measurement data the voltage data are still arriving from the experiment we're feeding the layer. so there are two things going on simultaneously the evaluation of the neural network layer by layer as well as the uh, noisy measurement data being fed in so that in total we add everything up we only get 50 nanoseconds of added latency due to the fact that there is such a neural network yes um, so yes um, you mean the number of layers that yes so um, this was this was carefully optimized so uh, we, we optimized what is the number of neurons, uh, which little fraction of the measurement data we feed in, and in the end, I, 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 it seems to be 12 layers or so. Um, so we have a number of layers here, and say maybe 20 neurons uh, or so per layer. So this is carefully <laughs> optimized. This is not your neural network that you run on your Jupyter notebook where you don't even know maybe <laughs> how many neurons you took. So this is really every neuron counts. Um, and then you can run it on the real experiment with a reward being given uh, by some measurement that teaches you how close you are to the ground state or whether you are in the ground state. And then you can start to analyze the, um, uh, the policy or the strategy that the neural network agent has learned. Uh, here I'm showing it for a case where we take into account that the qubit has e even a third level, so GEF state. And so you also have to have additional actions, uh, possibly you say flipping from the F state down to the G state, if that is your goal. And then uh, it's even a little bit of a challenge to analyze the, um, what the neural network is doing. Um, but for example, you can take the noisy measurement trace and um, take two integrated versions of the signal multiplying with uh, some uh, and uh, the resulting uh, probability of various actions in this from the measurement. And then you see things like if I'm deep in this regime, know that I'm in the ground state, I'm very confident, so I will stop my initialization procedure. It's in a vacant re regime, which is close to the boundary where you would finally say, oh no, it's not G, but it's E, uh, then uh, the agent is less certain. And so what it says is, let me just take another measurement. Let me not terminate now. Let me take another measurement just to become really certain that this was the ground state. Yeah, and there was a question. So, uh, uh, so the FPGA houses the agent, it houses the neural network. And it's model free in the sense we have not used any, say, Schrodinger equation to calculate what's going in inside the qubit. We haven't even calibrated the qubit. I mean, to some extent, of course, our experimentalist friends did have to calibrate the qubit because otherwise even their pulses wouldn't work. But we haven't, uh, uh, we, we are not really using any model of the quantum, dissipative quantum dynamics of the qubit. Yeah, so the agent is on the FPGA. This is something we control. But the qubit that represents the RL environment, so to speak, um, we don't make a model for it. Yes, please. Yeah, so here the actions are really things like a pulse that would take me from the E to the G. And of course, admittedly, this pulse has been calibrated. 
um, or a pulse that takes me from F to G. Yeah, these are the actions. Yes, in principle, yes. In practice, of course, um, it would have to be seen how well that converges um, because somehow that would mean that um, while it's trying to do this initialization, it's also trying to figure out, it's based, it, so to speak, during the reinforcement learning, it would then have to do even more of a calibration job implicitly because it's also trying to figure out at which frequency should I send my pulse to hit the frequency of the qubit. Yeah? But in principle, this is doable. It's just that we start from the simplest possible case because even that is <laughs> still hard. Okay, good. Ah, yes. So I missed the first part of the question. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, so the question is if I have a more complex system, more qubits, for example, uh, then Maybe my network needs more calculation power, uh, and that uh, can hurt me at some point. Uh, I would agree, yes. <laughs> we would have to carefully analyze uh, how many neurons I... So, so the way we are doing these things, of course, first we are running simulations just to get a general sense of uh, what we might need in terms of the neural network structure. Um, and it may very well be, if you make it too complex, then you cannot at the same time be very fast uh, anymore. So that's true. Okay, good. So let me move on and show you a very different setting. Now, um, what I've been talking about involved, say, a handful of qubits or even only a single qubit. Um, but eventually we want to go towards uh, these noisy intermediate scale quantum devices involving maybe 50 qubits or 100 qubits. So the question is a little bit, can we even do anything there, right? Um, and so certainly we will not be able to simulate their behavior uh, on the classical computer because um, there wouldn't be any point to have these devices. And so we need to have new ideas whether we can even apply reinforcement learning for these cases. And so uh, here, this is some work done with um, colleagues from Google Research, and it asks the question, if I have one of these devices with, say, a 50 qubits, um, and I already have an idea of a quantum circuit that maybe implements a useful algorithm, can the computer at least help me to optimize the circuit? Maybe to reduce the number of gates that I have, uh, to reduce the total running time, because that would already be useful. And the question would be, can we do this even without doing any simulation of the dynamics of the circuit because we won't be able to do a simulation in a reasonable amount of time? And so the answer is yes, it can be done if you realize that there are certain exact transformation rules where say you can take a couple of gates and replace them with say only two gates like uh, replacing this set of gates by these two gates. In that case, you can really um, do these transformations, which will reduce the total number of gates, and you're guaranteed that the functionality of the overall circuit remains the same, so you don't need to simulate. And so that is what we applied reinforcement learning to. So here the agent looks at a full quantum circuit, say the representation of a full quantum sequence of gates, and then it figures out at which of this full quantum circuit should I apply any one of these transformation rules. And so this is what this agent learned over many, many attempts, um, uh, always taking as input this 2D representation of a quantum circuit and taking as output a representation where it says at which location should I most likely implement a transformation. And we did train on random circuits. 
uh, that were obviously not optimal, and then the agent was tasked to uh, make them uh, more compact. And then after this agent had been uh, trained, it was doing really well on uh, improving uh, And we did co do comparisons, say, with simulated annealing, which is another completely general purpose um, optimization technique. Um, and so there the, um, the message is that if I, um, if I want to go for these very large uh, systems, then simulated annealing to reach a certain level of optimization of a single quantum circuit would take about a week. Whereas for the reinforcement learning, I would take a week and have an agent that can be applied to any quantum circuit and only needs a few hours to optimize uh, this particular quantum circuit. So as soon as you have several quantum circuits to optimize, you already win. Okay. And so maybe um, time is a little bit limited. So here I will only give you a glimpse of uh, another area where we now say, let's go for model-based reinforcement learning. So now we do want to exploit that. We do know the Schrodinger equation is at the heart of quantum dynamics. And so that goes in the field of quantum optimal control, which people have been using in the past to find good pulse sequences for, say, molecules or quantum computing devices. The general setting is that you have a field, like a pulse shape uh, versus time, and you want to optimize this, for example, to prepare a certain quantum state. And the way to do direct gradient ascent, say, on the fidelity state direct gradient because you know that the evolution is governed by the Schrodinger equation and so the most famous technique used in this area is called gradient ascent engineering grape so maybe the experimentalists among you have used that to find better pulse sequences and it's really the state of the art used for getting better pulse sequences in modern quantum devices. Here, for example, um, a publication from the Sholkov team at Yale, uh, trying to prepare a single Fox state, finding the proper pulse sequence uh, for that purpose. Okay. So now that is, say, a controller sending this pulse to the quantum system. However, sometimes the quantum system experiences some noise and decoherence. Uh, one way to fight against this is to bring in feedback. So occasionally to measure the quantum system, just as I explained also for the quantum error correction, allows you against noise introduced by the bath. And so that is important for tasks like in the presence of noise or quantum error correction. Is so far that this very powerful, efficient technique that is called GRAPE that I just mentioned that does direct gradient ascent uh, on the Schrodinger evolution, does not work uh, for feedback cases, for cases where you want to have a strategy uh, based on feedback. And so we introduced recently, so a combination of this direct gradient based optimal control, grape style, uh, with feedback. And so uh, let me give you the, the gist of the idea. So there will be time intervals where you have unitary evolution, let's say, and where you can change your control amplitudes, you would do in GRAPE. But then there will be instance in time where you do measurements. And then the subsequent uh, control amplitudes should be made conditional on the outcomes of these measurements. So that is the interesting part now. Uh, let me maybe uh, skip this and just point out that um, if you now want to do gradient ascent of the average reward with respect to the parameters you have, you need to take into account that this average reward depends on two things. It's the reward for a particular trajectory with a particular sequence of measurement outcomes, but then weighted with a probability to get this particular sequence of measurement outcomes. And that probability also depends on which controls you did apply because the probability for a quantum state is psi squared, and if the psi has been changed in one or the other way, depending on your previous control pulses, uh, it does depend on these control pulses. And so that introduces some interesting extra modifications. So if you now want to do gradient ascent, you get an extra term 
that is basically multiplying the reward with the log likelihood or the derivative of the log likelihood of the particular measurement outcome sequence. So that's, uh, so to speak, technically speaking, like the correction term you have to take into account if you want to um, take grape and embed feedback. These, let me come directly to examples so you can maybe see um, if you are interested to apply this to your own experiment, let's say. Um, so what we took as an example was a relatively famous model in quantum optics, the James Cummings model. So you have a single atom in a cavity talking to the cavity mode. Um, but in order to have feedback, we say maybe there's another atom that is also influenced by the state of the cavity can measure. So this is the situation. And if you even for a moment forget about the feedback and you just want to do preparation of a pure state, no noise, no feedback, no nothing, just preparation of a pure state, finding a good pulse sequence. So this is basically the grape situation. Then it turns out if you do apply this grape style optimal control that is model based, you are doing very well. This is shown here below the infidelity, the error decreases over time as you train. But if you apply any of the model free approaches that I was talking about in the beginning of the talk, these powerful techniques from computer science, you easily get stuck. So this is shown here. And that was actually our initial motivation that even in such a very simple uh, toy problem, so to speak, these model free reinforcement learning techniques can get stuck versus the model based approach is really, really working very well. So this is still without feedback, uh, but then you can start to add feedback. Um, and uh, an ancilla qubit depending on the number of photons inside the cavity. And let me skip this, but then you can go towards a different tasks. So for example, you can say, I have a noisy initial state, I want to purify it. So each measurement teaches me a little bit about the state inside the cavity. Uh, can I eventually arrive at a pure state? And it turns out that uh, with the help of this new approach, you can find even an adaptive purification strategy. So if I measure this outcome, then the next measurement should be done in a certain basis. If I measure another outcome, then I should choose another basis. And, so. and then you can also do state preparation in the presence of noise. So you start, say, with a thermal state and you wanted a particular superposition of Fox states. You can also do this. Um, and there's an interesting observation that here, the attempt to purify the state and the controls that are necessary to produce a certain outcome state are interleaved by the strategy that is discovered uh, by this approach. And then finally, you can also do state stabilization. So assume there's constantly decay and noise going on, but there's a certain, say, Fox state or superposition state that you want to stabilize. How do you do this? And the thing is here, um, you can train on short time trajectories. And then if you're using a certain kind of neural network, it can actually extrapolate what it learned at these short times to arbitrarily long times to basically constantly uh, stabilize the state. Okay, so that um, is really the end of my story. And the take home message is that these techniques uh, have now become so powerful that um, in the next few years, I really expect them to um, come into play in many experiments that exist. Okay, thank you very much. Ha, a very good question. So I think um, here it wouldn't be, so first it wouldn't be able to because of the uh, actions that we supply, uh, because I wouldn't even have a pi half rotation <laughs> uh, or something. Um, but also we are just asking it to uh, initialize into the ground state in the end, right? Whereas spin echo, the, the question, we, we should change the question. We, we should say, okay, I um, produce, let's say, a superposition in the equatorial plane, uh, so equal superposition, but with an arbitrary phase, and I want to retain that 
uh, can you help me, uh, please? And then, of course, it would depend on the situation. So I think here, the simple decay or thermalization, which is Markovian, is, is the main effect. So you would have to look for an experimental situation uh, where there, you have rather slow drift of parameters uh, where such spin echo would be helpful. But it's a good question. So it's always a question, okay, what's the situation? What's the actions you supply? What's really uh, the rewards you give? Yeah. So we did actually, uh, I omitted this, we did train on circuits of 12 qubits um, to optimize those. And then immediately the neural network that we had trained on these 12 qubit circuits could be um, applied also to the 50 qubit circuit. And the reason was there's a so-called convolutional network, the same kind that people use for image recognition. So it is, so to speak, it uh, exploits translational invariance. So what it means if if it has understood to discover a certain pattern inside the 12 qubit uh, circuits, it will also go looking for the same patterns on the larger circuits. So, so scaling up is here actually no problem at all. Okay, so I think the model-based part is still very new, very recent. So, um, uh, I mean, there has always been the grape technique, but that's purely without any feedback. So the strategies are simple. It's just optimal uh, control pulses. And that is still very new. So basic, so very obviously our task now is in various uh, situations to see which one is better. This appeared to be a situation where the model-based uh, one worked better, yeah. Uh, but we don't have any general rule of thumb so far. Okay, yeah. Yep. So you're talking about the quantum error cor uh, uh, correction uh, case um, where we um, uh, and give it a reward at any given time, uh, asking how much of the quantum information is preserved. And, okay, so maybe we can talk about it uh, uh, during the break afterwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so, yeah, any more questions? Okay. Stop the video.